And we're live. Okay. Get this going. Okay, I hope, I hope your marbles are in order, because uh, you'll need them, and I'll need them, and I hope I have mine as well. I'm no different than you. So, there's a difference between a left brain and a right brain. Left brain could represent the logic, and I'm going to kind of blow up just so we could see this a little bit. Logic... The left brain has logical, sequential, rational, analytical, objective, and it looks at parts. Those are the dynamic um, principles, if you will, of the left brain. While the right one exercises random thoughts, it's intuitive, holistic, synthesizing, subjective, and it looks things at holes. So if we could zoom in at the other picture, you could see the little eyes where the left and the right are. In the middle of that yellow line is your corpus uh, callosum. That bridge, it's like a bridge between the two brains. Okay, and it, it goes a little bit in depth. So it's, the left side is logical, it has language, analytical, grammar, punctuation, sequential, detail, letters and numbers. It, it's, it's for decoding, short-term memory, uh, auditory memory thinks according to the rules and patterns, uh, fine motor, sense of time, planned, controls the right side of the body, while the right one is creative, pictures, and intuitive, uh, kind of some of the words that borrows from this uh, image, tonality, illustrations, uh, simultaneous uh, tasks. It looks at things at big picture, symbols, spatials, encoding, long-term, long uh, visual memory, thinks outside of the square, uh, gross uh, motor skills, no sense of time, spontaneous, controls the left side of the body. So, while we're studying this message, can we afford to take away, if I could stand and block the right, can we get through the the message, the teaching, having only left side? Yes, we can. Because there's grammar, analytical skills, it's logic, so the whole teaching is based on logic as well. But what about the right side? If we fuse these things together, it's like a body. Everything works perfect when everything is exercised. So the body of Yeshua, if all the siblings do their portion, beautiful things come together when everybody's in agreement. You get more done, you're much more successful. So the brain needs to operate wholly to receive the fullness of the teaching, of the instructions, of and some other things. So, let's look at Lucifer. Lucifer, I'm gonna read from Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 through 17. You can turn to your Bibles or you can look at the screen. I'll just read from, this, from, from here. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom. And I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to emphasize the key words when I say things like, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden and in the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the car... Uh, Carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of your timbrels or your and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are an anointed cherub that covers, and I have set you so. You were upon the you're upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created, till iniquity or lawlessness was found in you. By the multitude of your trades, or you could look at its schemes, they have, filled, they have filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned, transgressed. 
Therefore I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, in the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, and you have corrupted your wisdom. You have corrupted your wisdom. And in parentheses, I have no longer distinguished between right and left. It takes us right back to the brain. You can no longer distinguish right and left. You can almost say you can't distinguish between right and wrong. And obviously, if, if you chose to disobey God, I think you're. I think that's pretty mu pretty much summons everything. It's you, you. You can't. You can't distinguish between right and wrong because of your splendor. I will cast you to the ground, and I will lay before kings that they may behold you. So. We see that Lucifer here, he has corrupted his own wisdom because the Father says so. Father anointed Ezekiel. Ezekiel wrote everything down. And, and, and here we have Lucifer corrupted his own wisdom. So what is wisdom and who's the giver of wisdom? God is the giver of wisdom. He gives us the ability to comprehend and distinguish between right and left, right and wrong. And so... From there, we're going we're gonna to climb down the ladder, if you will. I'm going to use that analogy. We're going to climb down from the spiritual down to the physical. So we're going to go to Adam and Eve. And uh, like Lucifer, Adam and Eve's, quote-unquote, corrupted their wisdom. They, they corrupted their own wisdom, just like Lucifer did. Their spirits were clogged up by flesh and circumcision of this flesh uh, to allow their spirit to operate would eventually uh, become necessary. So at, at, at some point, the circumcision of the heart, the circumcision of the flesh would become necessary. And we see that from, from the very beginning when they corrupted their own wisdom, just like Lucifer. Man's mind was befuddled so he could no longer distinguish between right and left. He had discontinued fishing in the ordered water of the spirit realm and tried to reason things by using only his left brain and his lower nature. Let's go back to that brain picture. And I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that uh, the only reason by using their left side of the brain. So here, left side says it's logic. And a lot of times, we as humans, that's the first thing we jump to. We want to know, when we study scripture, we want to say, is it logical? You know, can the people cross the water? Can't really, can he be really a fire by night and a cloud by day? We try to reason, we try to always calculate <coughs> things, and we completely avoid the supernatural side of God. And so... We can get by. We can get by with having the left side of our, of our brain and praise the Father that he, has, that he has done that. That when Adam and Eve corrupted their own wisdom, their wisdom, which he gave, at least he gave them enough to get by through the world. And so we see even grace in that little, in that, in the, in that section, in the very beginning. So... They can no longer reason by using the left side of the brain and their lower nature. Jonah 4.11 kind of lends, lends us an example. And should I, should I not, this is God speaking, spare Nineveh, the great city in which are more than six score, 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right and their left hand, and also many cattle? I mean... It's almost like, I think he's like, stab, he's, he's taking a stab here. It's, he's saying they can't discern between right and their left hand, and also there are many cattle. Okay, in addition to their discernment, is there many cattle, or can cattle do a better job of discerning, and you guys are just so stupid. But nonetheless, the father doesn't want to take Jonah's proposal because he doesn't want to go there. He's just just destroy him. I don't feel like dealing dealing with him. He's no 120,000 people. You need to go minister. They can discern, and I'm giving you Jonah wisdom that you can rightly divide my words and teach him. 
We see another point in John 21, verse 5 through 6. Then Yeshua said unto them, Children, have you any fish? They answered him, No. And he said, Cast. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find it. They cast therefore, and now they were, they were not able to draw for a multitude of fish. I find it a little funny. I'm not sure you can see my underlining here, but they, uh, it's all the way at the bottom. Let me see if I can bring it up a little bit. So they cast their net on the right side of the ship. Well, I think the logical part of my brain is telling me they were out on the water. The most likely, they just threw their nets on the left side of the boat, and here comes this guy, and he's telling them, throw your nets on the right side. Who's this guy? We've been out here like for eight hours fishing on the same spot. All of a sudden, he comes along, throw on the right side. Their left brain was telling them there's no big deal. But when they listened to him, he imparted wisdom, and in obedience, they accomplished a great task. This gives a new meaning to the practice of circumcision, which is an allegory for cutting away the, the hindrance of the spinal cord flesh influence that, that influences our human spirit. Now the logical question becomes, if after the fall and ad, after the fall, Adam and Eve fell into this clogged up mind system of the left side of the brain, the lower nature, only using that side, where did this mind of the higher nature go? So what happened when the point where they corrupted their wisdom? Did it just fade away? Just the, the father just put a vacuum in their head and sucked up their, the, the right side of the brain? It would seem that Yahuwah took, took that away, waiting for a man to get rid of the flesh thoughts that clog up the wells of his spirit. Yahuwah shut up the new Jerusalem soul, if you will, until man circumcised the entangled flesh, serpent thinking, from his mind. Yahuwah would not allow the seed of the serpent to be sown in the chaste virgin mind reserved for his son. Our, our high priest Yeshua. And we see that in Genesis 3.24. So he, Yahovah, drove out the man and he placed at the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and flaming <coughs> swords which turned every way to guard Shomer, the way of the tree of life. So now we climb that ladder I told you about from 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 the Lucifer, given that incredible anointing, where he was perfect in every way, he, had, he was full of wisdom until he corrupted it. Then we climb down that spiritual ladder down to the physical realm, and we deal with the corruption of Adam and Eve's mind. And now we're climbing down the years of existence. And so now we come into the Levitical priesthood, priesthood, which is established. So let's see where... And by the way, when you think about the full brain and the way it operated when, when, when Lucifer was full of wisdom, he had this relationship of talking to the Father. You could commune. You could, he had the closeness, the intimacy that every one of us would desire. And we have it on some level now. And Adam and Eve had that prior to their own corruption because they talked with God. They walked with God. Right? They didn't, have, they didn't have a high priest at that time, a mediator. They, they walked with God. Just a song. They walked with God and talked with God. Right? So, what a privilege that was. And until, when that moment came when they corrupted themselves by disobedience and iniquity took, took root, that's, the separation happened. And we could see that like, we see the animals turning on each other. We see beautiful fruit growing thorns. All of a sudden things are, the man, man's ability and man's dominion over things to take care of it was so flawed that the creation separated itself from them. And so how would the father, we know that he kicked them out of the garden. He does not want to communicate with them anymore, Right? And so they're outside the garden. Well, how do they speak to the Father? Did they ever have a chance to speak to Him? No. 
They didn't, they didn't talk with him. They didn't talk with him like they, walk, like they talked with him in the garden. That was done. The spiritual scissors severed that spinal cord, that, that taproot giving all that knowledge and wisdom. They were done. And so how, how do people talk to God now? And so we climb down this ladder and we see the Levitical priesthood established. And we'll see how the will of the Father is now once again established for man to communicate with God. The priests who served at the tabernacle and later at the temple were required to be, one of the requirements was descendants of Aaron, and the high priest was required to be selected from this line. Specific, uh, specific designed garments in Exodus uh, chapter 28 were made for the high priests, and those garments uh, were worn for the holy duties. Here we have those garments. Every high priest wore a turban. There was a gold ring, it's like a ring on our finger, that said, Holy unto the Lord. He wore a tunic, which is a white dress. It, it basically goes from your neck all the way down. You can see a little bit over here. It finishes over there. I'm going to grab something really quick. And then we have a blue robe that they're wearing. They have an ephod, which is kind of like an apron. It goes over your tunic. It's both sided. It's a sash is, is basically a belt that they, that they gird this blue apron with. <clears throat> um, the, the, the breastplate, which, is, which was a, a, a square, and it was folded. So it was a rectangle folded in half. And here we have 12 stones. And the 12 stones have the 12, uh, the 12 names of the tribes of Israel. And there are two onyx stones. Two onyx stones that are hidden right here. There are little pouches in this. And I'm going to turn off the lights really quick so you can see a more vivid picture because... The colors are so brilliant and beautiful. So here we have these two onyx stones, and there are just little, like, little cutaways where they, where they go, they go in. And then the blue robe had bells and pomegranates. So imagine this high priest walking about, and you would, these are gold. So you hear, and I just have a little tiny bell, right? That's nothing. But think of that garment. I mean, he was visible because you couldn't mistake this. This was not his daily garment, okay? This was put on specifically for inner temple duties. And so this guy, this high priest would walk around and there would be bells clinging next to each other, the bells and, and, the, and the little metal pomegranates. We'll come back to that picture again. So let's read. Let's go and start reading what, what these... Let's get God's point of view in print from Exodus chapter 28 versus... Uh, let's see. We'll, we'll start at Exodus 28 two first. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. It's for glory and for beauty because this was not something... Ordinary. This was not something common. When God makes something holy, He wants it to stand out. And so, these instructions came from the Most High. He told specifically what He wanted, and you had to do it. And in order to achieve that, He put a spirit of skill into the craftsmen, and they, they accomplished that. So we know it's for glory and beauty. And now we'll read Exodus chapter 28, verses 4 through 21. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, and a robe, an embroidered coat, a turban, and a band. And they, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister unto them in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And they shall make an ephod of gold, of blue and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine linen. Uh, 
twinned linen and skillful and with skillful work. It shall have its two shoulder pieces joined at the two edges, and it shall be joined together. And the and the skillfully wo woven band, I can't I can't do W's for the life of me sometimes. That's my Russian coming out, so don't. Okay, don't 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 tease me. I can't say I say vine and and when I want a bottle of vine, I have a problem with that, okay? She knows it, she she knows my my ruski coming out. Or okay. German. <laughs> yeah. So Okay, where was it? I want to pronounce it again. Okay. S skillfully woven <laughs> band of, of the ephod which is upon it, and it shall be of the same workmanship according to its work, even of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet, and fine twined linen. And you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of children of Israel, six names on one stone and six names on the rest of the stone. So let's go back to that picture again. The two onyx stones. So one's over here, it's got six names on this side, six names on that side. It has nothing to do with the 12 stones right here on this breastplate, okay? And by the way, um, it was done according to their birth. So that's where the order comes in. That's how it was done. If people, if people question how was it done, it's, it's to the order. And that's very important. We need to know that because who gets dibs? And, we'll, and why, why they in such an order and what they will tell us later as we go through the teaching. With the work of an engraver, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. You shall you shall make them to be a, to be set in the settings of gold, and you shall put the two names put the two stones upon the shoulders of an ephod for the stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord, before Jehovah, upon his two shoulders for a memorial. And you shall make a settings of gold and two chains of pure gold at the ends. And a braided work shall, shall you make them. And fasten the braided chains to the settings. And you shall make the breastplate of judgment with skillful work. Like the work of, like the, work of the ephod you shall make it, of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet, and of fine twine linen. And you shall make it. Four square it shall be, and doubled. A span shall be the length of it, and a span shall be the breadth of it, or the width of it. And you shall set in the settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be sardius, or a ruby, a topaz, a carbuncle, or an emerald. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jason, a jacinth, or a, or a ligure. And a gate and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a barrel and an onyx and a jasper. And they shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel. Twelve, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with its name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. We're going to skip to verses 29 and 30. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goes into the when he goes in unto the holy place for a memorial before Yehovah continually and you shall put it in the breastplate of judgment with the urim and the thummim and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goes in before Yehovah and Aaron shall bear the judgment of children of Israel upon his heart before Yehovah continually here we have another picture of the vestments. Everything was shown in the, in the first picture. All priests, including the high priest, wore a tunic and a sash and, an, and, and linen <coughs> uh, breeches. The rest of the clothing for the priests included a cap as a head covering. Additionally, the high priests wore the following, and we just read through that. So 
the high priest was to do the work of the Lord in ministering to the tribes represented on his shoulders. He was symbolically um, <clears throat> he was symbolically to carry the people in front of the Lord. He was to be their spiritual leader. In addition, the onyx stones were engraved in such a manner that each of the tribe could be read by the Lord as he looked down from the heavenly heights. That, oh my goodness, that, that gave me the shivers when I, when I was just thinking about that. That Yahweh could look down and he could see that representation of his people right on his chest, ministering to them, teaching them, being a light to them. I'm going to turn the lights down just so you can see a little bit better how beautiful that is. You can see the names. So it's not just a ministering, but it's also, but, but they're, but the tribes are so close to his breast, to his heart. He had to have a special heart for, for his people. He was to love them and teach them. He was to serve them in front of the Lord. He was, the high priest was an example of the servant leader. And it's a beautiful transition what Yeshua is. He was the high priest and he was an, an example, a, a, a beautiful example of, of the servant leader. So, some of the interesting things I want to note is, notice that the garments are in general position of the pollineal gland. And everybody knows what that is, right? It's, in the, it's right in the back here. It's kind of like your, well, it's, it's your root to the brain. So the anointing comes there, and we live in a world, not to go off a small rabbit trail, but we live in a world with so many heavy metals and so many toxins that it pollutes that pineal gland. And so, that's a gland where incredible anointing comes into. You get closer to the Father, it's, 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 a, it's almost like a spiritual root. So, it's, uh, it's also interesting to note that the colors of the high priests, his, his vestments were gold, scarlet, and blue. All the same colors, the material of the veil. So, when you go into the Holy of Holies, it was... He, I'm sure if like stood next to next to some of the tapestries, he would just blend <coughs> into it because the colors were identical. <coughs> this attire, as I said earlier, was very visible and very noisy. It was designed to be attractive. Father wanted to be very specific because it represented him and everything that he designed patterned the heavenlies. That's why he's so specific. That's why he's so specific with the tabernacle. Because he wanted to mirror what's happening in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the heavenly inner and outer courts. His presence was obvious, and it should be with it also should be with us, his children, and as the kingdom of priests, as Exodus 19, 6 and Revelation 1, chapter 1 and 6 and chapter 5 and 10 point out. We are a kingdom of priests, and any perpetual kingdom of priests. So when you look at the satire. It's, it's a far cry from the traditional black that many ministers wear today. It doesn't, it, it's so bland. I mean, this is a beautiful, beautiful representation. So, as I said earlier, these clothes were specific to the tabernacle worship duties only. When they were not in the inner court, they were wearing probably just, just these tunics. That's it. Tunics, maybe some sort of a belt and something else, but... And look at this, right? You'll, if you do a search, you'll, ne you'll find an X. You will never find anything on their feet. It's so interesting. There are no sandals, okay? And when I'm talking about when, you know, these are specific, 
and for temple duties only. You know, a linen ephod, which is a tunic, uh, was worn by ordinary priests. You can see that in 1 Samuel 22, 18. The king then ordered Doeg, you turn and strike down the priests. So Doeg and then the Adamite turned and struck them down that day and killed 85 men who were linen ephod. So we know the people that he killed were not high priests because they also wore linen ephod. We also see in, in 2 Samuel ver, uh, chapter 6, 14, David wearing a linen ephod danced before the Lord with all of his might. And the image I think that comes to our minds is that we think of him dancing in his underwear a lot of times. That's why Mahel was so, his wife was so furious with him. She, you're, you're a king and you're dancing in your underwear in the street. Well, I don't think that really was. I think he was wearing this, his, his tunic, his white linen, linen tu, uh, tunic. On his forehead, the, the high priest wore a gold engraving and says, Holy to the Lord. The forehead representing the mind meant that the, that the holy to the Lord shall always be first and foremost on the mind of the high priest. And even as well as us. We as his children should have him first and foremost. Uh, lastly, no mention is made, like I said earlier, regarding the shoes. For either the high priests or the other priests. Because we know that not all Levite priests were sons of Aaron. They were, they were doing some other work, some other ministerial work. And many scholars suggest that it looks like the priests were to serve barefoot when they were in the tabernacle itself in a spirit of humbling themselves as servants before Yehovah. And I, I included Exodus 3, 5 here about Moses. And he, Yehovah, said, Draw near here. Put off your shoes from your feet, Moses, for the place on which you stand is a holy ground. I think it's very symbolic. He had to do it now, and he was right before him. I mean, talk about like the Holy of Holies. I mean, he heard him speak. It was incredible. And so, now let's address the will of God. <coughs> Let's address how, how these high priests communicated because Adam and Eve lost it. Lu Lucifer lost it. Adam and Eve lost it. And so th there's, a, there's a gap of this intimate communication and the Father out of His mercy and grace for His people establishes once again a 1-800 number for them to call and know exactly what He wants. To understand His will. <clears throat> so we know that let's go back to that picture where the, the two onyxes were they're right right at the shoulders right really close to their to their pineal gland and, and to their mind it, it was always on their hearts and those two stones were very specific very unique nothing like the other twelve These stones were called Urim and Thummim. And they were used specifically for deserving the will of God. Some translate them as lights and perfection, and some say revelation and truth. Interpreting Urim could also mean those whose words give light, and for Thummim it means those uh, whose words are fulfilled. So you have one here, one here, Lights or perfection or revelation and truth. The high priest would have a question. Then the way of the then the way of the stones, then the way the stones uh, came out of the breastplate or displayed upon the ground. And the answer is, let me rephrase that. I'm tr I'm stumbling over my notes. So the high priest would have to ask the question. It would have to be yes or no. It would have to be one of the stones had to do something. The only mention of the actual consultation of Yahweh by means of the Urim and Thummim found in Torah is in Numbers 
chapter 27, verses 8, 18 through 21. So we see it when reading Exodus 28, we see that it's, it's, it's embedded. It's embedded, but it's never used. We never see in Exodus that they're actually using it. So we have to go to the uh, book of Numbers, chapter 27, verse 18 through 21. And, and Yahweh said unto Moses, Take you Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And you shall put some of your honor upon him. And all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask the counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before Yehovah. At his word shall they go out. And at his word they shall come in, both he and the children of Israel with him, even the congregation. So we see Eleazar was a high priest, and Moses was permitted by the Lord to address him directly. But Joshua and his successors could not speak to Yahweh directly as Moses and Eliezer did. Only through the mediation of the high priest by the means of Urim and Thummim. The answer had to be yes or no. There was no, there was no gray area. You didn't have to... Maybe there was, no, there was no third stone. And so we see that reading... 1 Samuel 14, 41. Then Saul prayed to Yahweh, the God of Israel, Why have you not answered your servant today? If the fault is in me, or my, or my son Jonathan, respond with an Urim. Respond with a yes. But if the men of Israel are at fault, respond with a Thummim. Respond with a no. Jonathan and Saul were taken by Lot, and the men were cleared. There's your answer. We also see God is never like us. He's the same. He's consistent. He tells you directly what he wants to do. You're never confused. You're never, you never doubt what your commission should be. And so we see Yeshua, Yeshua speaking th these very words in Matthew chapter 5, 37. Let your communication be yea or nay. For whatsoever is more than these comes from comes from evil. Another, I think, I think you, you'll see a different version and, and Luke says, let your, let, your yes, let your yay be yay and your nay be nay, lest you be judged. We also see in James chapter 5, 12, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall under judgment. So here's, James kind of is putting that into print. <clears throat> Another interesting thing is that we see three different communications in the Bible. And, and we, see, um, we see that with Saul. We see that with Saul communicating with Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 through 6, we see that these three methods. One is the dream oracle of which frequent mention is made. And it's also in the Assyrian and Babylonian literature. The oracles by which of the Urim, which we'll read here, undoubtedly an abbreviation for Urim and Thummim, and the oracle by the word of the prophets, found also among the Semitic nations. So now Samuel was dead, and all Israel lamented him and buried him in Ramah and even in his own city. And Saul had put away the mediums and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together, and they came and, they, and, they came and encamped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of Yehovah, Yehovah answered him not, neither by dreams, neither by Urim and Thummim, which is a yes or no, and neither by prophets. Silence. So, we know why he didn't communicate with Saul, because Saul was presumptuous. We could dive into this, the first Samuel 
really deeply, but the study of the teaching is going to be very long. And, but presumption led Saul... Presumption was basically the, the, leading, uh, the leading instrument in, in severing the ties with the father. He was, Saul didn't wait for Samuel. He was presumptuous. He did things himself. He, he, he contacted the, medi the mediums and the wizards, which are s sorcerers, and they have a different way about going about seeking an answer. They had formulas, these dark, and I don't want to do a teaching on it. I don't, I don't even want to go into that. That's so demonic, I don't even want to share it with my siblings. And so Saul was completely severed off. His, he corrupted his own wisdom because the father, the father blessed him. He gave, he gave Israel a king, even though God was their king first. He gave them Saul. And he, he corrupted his own wisdom. We see a few other uh, post-Babylonian accounts where the, the Urim and Thummim go in, and uh, Old Testament seems to indicate that Urim, Thum, and, and, uh, Urim and Thummim faded from the use during the early days of Israel's monarchy and are only a reference to once more after the return of Babylonian exile. It is quite po uh, probable that the generation of Ezra and Nehemiah were no, no, no longer cognizant of the nature of Urim and Thummim. And here's, I mean, these are exactly two same accounts. Um, I mean, these are almost word for word. Ezra chapter 263 and Nehemiah 765. I won't even read Nehemiah. And the governor said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things until a priest could consult with an Urim and with a Thummim, with those two onyx stones. After the Bible, after this, after these accounts, uh, post-Babylonian uh, exile, the Bible never mentions the Urim and Thummim again. I think Yahweh didn't want to preserve that method of, of speaking to his people anymore. He, he was done with it. It seems that Yahweh replaced Urim and Thummim through, uh, through the office of prophets. And then the prophets participated in that, in, in that God's heavenly court and communicated God's messages to, to the kings, to the people, and throughout all uh, Old Testament writings. So, I don't know what you're expecting. I think a lot of people, when I go into, when, when I mention Urim and Thummim, some don't understand it completely because it's not even being taught. I, I don't think anybody's teaching, really teaching on that. And some expect this like really juicy stuff, like, oh, we're going to dive into the sorcery, and God is a sorcerer, and he's going to do this. Well, let's use both sides of the brain. There's a logical thing, and then there's a supernatural thing. The Father chooses the physical things for us to, to use and, and see the supernatural. So you end up using two onyx stones. You could have chose two sticks, to whatever, seashells, or, but he chose to use precious stones. There's always a connection between what, what happened earlier. And we read and we know about Lucifer that he was decorated with all the precious stones. It's like he was this <coughs> a decorated being and all these, the most beautiful things were given to him. But it's, it's really not. It was just it was just an avenue that the people could seek the will of God. And it had to be done through a mediator. And so it, this, this seeking of the will of God, now it, it, it brings us to today. I mean, we don't have Urim and Thummim. We don't have the priesthood. How do you know the will of God? When you come here today, how do you know the will of God? Well, the obvious is Shabbat. He says, keep Shabbat holy so you hear. But I'm talking about, should we go to the feasts over there or over there? Should I open a new church? A bad word. Should I open a fellowship? How do I get, how do I get that will 
I don't, I don't wear those onyx stones. I, I, I don't get it. But how do I get, how do I get the answer and the, and, and the, and the, to know the matter of Father's heart? Well, discerning the will of God is very important because the other flip side is presumption. So here we have, we're having, he gives us a strong admonition because we see that the post-Babylonian exile, the priests start doing something. It's like the cats away, the mice will play scenario. And we see in Malachi 2, chapter 2, verse 1 and 7 and 8, Listen, ye priests, this command is for you. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law, seek the Torah at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord. But you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law, at the Torah. You see, the secret things belong unto our Lord, but the things that which he reveals belong unto us and to our children forever, so that may we do all the words of the Torah. And that's in Deuteronomy 29, 29. There should be no doubt. There should be no, there should be no reason why we cannot know that His will. It's Today we have 30 plus thousand denominations proclaiming liberty from the Torah as if somehow it's, you know, it's done away, it's got a very short uh, shelf life, it's, nobody's interested in it. And these ministers are very adamant and very passionate about proclaiming this false, false will to many of the sheep. It's not just believe on Jesus and you get your ticket punched and you know, no hell can stop you. It's, it takes much more than that. We're subject to his daily government. We're subject to his Torah, his sovereignty, if we're to understand him and his plan. You see, even the high priests were dressed in all of, in all this uh, priestly glory. It was not that the clothes that made the man, but the spirit with which he served Yehovah and his people. When he put that breastplate on, and he knew that the magnitude of that task, when he put that breastplate on and all the names are written, he, he had a duty to perform. And so just like just as I have a duty to perform here today and, and anybody else who's teaching, it's it's not a light thing, and we'll be judged if we if we deviate from that path. If that's how it should be, that we should have a a mock-up, if you will. It should be engraved in our head that this thing is hanging on our chest. And as if we come to that knowledge of teaching the Torah and teaching everything, it should remind us. Who are to teach? Who are the who are the tribes? Who are the people that we're serving? And how are we supposed to serve without any sort of adding or subtracting from His Word? The high priests were responsible for serving at the tabernacle. Only they could approach Yahweh in His holy place, and only the high priest could enter the holy of holies and the tabernacle on only one day of the year with the appropriate offerings. Anyone who else approached, anybody else who approached would surely die. So today, those in rabbinical Judaism missed a crucial need for a mediator between man and God. And it would do them well to study the role of the priests as represented in the Torah. Because a lot of times, just we have seen, people don't understand that. And that's the first, that's the first question I ask anybody who is so arrogant and who is so strong He's, it's like he's wearing these umum and therm. It's, it's almost like they know yes or no. That's how sure they are. And then I ask them, who is your high priest? Because we have a high priest, the eternal high priest after the order of Melchizedek. It's, and that's Yeshua. But somebody who doesn't have that, you're a dead man. You might as well be Adam and Eve cut off from the garden where the flaming swords are protecting you from going to the tree of life, and you will never enter into that intimate spiritual environment. 
It should remind us that our great high priest, Yeshua Messiah, even now sits at the right hand of God, making supplications and intercessions for us. I want to read Hebrews 9, 11, uh, 9 verses 11 through 15, just to highlight it. But when, but when Yeshua appears, the high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more per perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of the goats and, and cows, but through his own blood. He entered the holy, holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For, the blood of, for if the blood of the goats and the bulls and the ashes of, of the heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Yeshua Messiah, who through the eternal spirit, eter, eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from the dead works. For this is the reason he is the mediator of a new covenant, or a renewed covenant, I should say. In order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that they committed under the first covenant, the covenant which they broke, a covenant why the father divorced them for, they were just like Adam and Eve. They were wandering around. There was flaming swords protecting the tree of life, and until, Yesh until Yeshua came and died, they wouldn't have no promise. They would be forever cut off from the Garden of Eden, using, using that metaphor. They could never come, they could never be part of a family, they could never be part of a new covenant, nothing. In order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgression they committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of of the internal inheritance. Here's a model example. This is what the attitude and the conduct of every disciple, minister, preacher, and pastor of a God should be. So this is, these are the key verses of anybody out there, outside of these walls. Every Christian denomination, this is why we have 30, 38,000, because did they really receive the will of the Father? Did they really hear, I should start a congregation? Did they, did they really hear from God, well, we don't like electrical mu mu uh, instruments. We'll go, we'll just use a drum, and we'll start a new congregation based on that. We'll start a new movement. Then somebody else says, well, I don't like music, and consider that a sin, and starts a new congregation. Did they, hear, did they hear from the Father? Did he just open up the clouds and say, start a new, start a new denomination, divide my body, even more so, and keep going, don't stop. No, it's presumption. It's presumption. This is why this is this is why it's so important. Here's the model example. Ecclesiastes 113. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all the things that are done under the heaven. He gave his heart. A teacher gave his heart to seek and search out the wisdom. You can replace the word wisdom with Torah. Search out the Torah concerning all things that are done under heaven. So Torah is the perfect instruction. But do 30,000, 38,000 plus denominations do that? Do they seek the Father? Do they seek with all of their fiber of their being, sweating and not starting that congregation? Should we do this? Should we create more chaos in the world. So if you don't like this church, you can just walk across the street to the other one. And if you don't like the instruments they play, why don't you should come over here? And if you don't like that one, come over there. We have some strobe lights to go with it. And we sell coffee, and our seats reclined, and we give you blankets. Oh, it's so good. Moving on, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and 9. Here's another, here's another point. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. And this is not simply verse plucking. Okay, This is, this is not talking about verse plucking. You don't just pluck little things which people use... Scripture, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. Line upon line is context. 
When you, lay, when you lay a row of bricks and you know you have, you have a house to build, you don't stop halfway because you laid a line upon line and you say, oh, it's good enough. I laid a line and somebody else can finish the rest. Well, a house needs to be built. So use the context. Use the parameters which you are giving. Line upon line in what? In a context. So it's not about verse plucking. It's taking, it's beside being wise, the, the ministers and the teachers were, were to teach people knowledge. Again, that not, you replace knowledge with Torah because that's what it is. They were teaching people Torah, weighing and studying and arranging all the principles, all the proverbs of Torah with great care. I mean, and you, we see a difference today. We see these preachers, they give these kind of candy cane, you know, sermons where it's beautiful and it's fluffy, but it has no substance. You can't do anything. Once you bite on it, it just disappears. That's it. And that's why you have so many false converts. People come in, they want to seek the truth, they want to receive instruction because they're coming out of a, a chaotic world. They want to see guidelines. They want to, they want to see these parameters in which they should live and be, and be blessed by. But they come into it and they're, they're depending on that teacher that should be wearing that great attire. It should be noisy and colorful. You cannot miss him. His face should be glowing because he's, he loves God. He loves instruction. So he's just like Moses. He's speaking to the Father. He, do, he can't commune. He can't communicate like the high priest did, but he's, he's spending some serious knee time Praying and seeking. What is his will? Discerning what he should do. Not being presumptuous. Well, you know, I think I'll give this message this week. Because, oh, why not? People like that, right? Let's, let's talk about this. Pick up. No. You have to really seek the Father. I mean, there's always a season. There's a time that you, you, you stay quiet. You sit back and you listen, and you receive instruction from him, let it, you have to spend quiet time to download all that stuff. And then he gives it to you, and then you upload it, and then you share it with everybody else. The words of the wise in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 11, the, the words of the, of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Their collected sayings or teachings are like nail-studded sticks with which a shepherd drives the sheep. How many people do you see today that really drive the sheep with studded sticks? They will all leave. Why? Because they like the lights. They like the recliners. They like the coffee. And by God, if they're not going to get their creamer and their Danish while they're at it, they're going to find it in the congregation. Because there's 38,000 to pick from. Nobody likes, and this is the thing, we should never resist the prodding of the Spirit. And the flesh gets in the way. That's what, that's what got in the way of Adam and Eve. Their flesh-clogged mind got in the way. That's what corrupted their wisdom. Because they could commune with the Father. Walk in the cool of the day with Him. And once they disobeyed, they hid. They knew where they were. He just said, he just made it, he just, he just said it out. Hey, where are you guys? <coughs> see him, see him through the trees, through his creation. Why? He's made, basically saying, why are you hiding? And he knew that already as well. But that's what separated them. Their flesh-clogging thoughts they started thinking and they forgot immediately what the instructor taught. They resisted the prodding of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that today. And we should never resist it because a lot of times we hear sermons and it might even poke, it might be the right timing and it might poke at us and it's like, is this guy reading my mail? Like, I've heard many sermons when the Father anointed and, and placed me at the right time to hear something where the pamphlet came my way 
because somewhere two hours before he picked up a nail studded thing and he whacked me in the butt with it and I came home you know running and and here's something on the doorstep or or I've, I've heard a message or a friend or somebody that came in contact with me gave me a verse and I didn't like it my flesh didn't like it but the spirit accepted it and then it started once once you become obedient once you accept that prodding your right side of the brain that was missing starts working and you start to receive that wisdom and when two are things working together beautiful things happen he gives more and to whom I give, I will require. I want to show you the pictures of inner and outer court. I'm going to tune the lights real quick just for you to get this beautiful rendition. So, Holy of Holies, inner court, outer court, and you can see these little ants of the people just, just, man, just running in there, right? Why not? place was huge. It was huge. So, this is applicable for us today. All Israel had access to the outer courts. Outer courts. All everybody had access to it. All of Israel. Could freely come in and out. You had plenty of gates to come in and out. Whereas only the high priest could enter into the inner courts. His holy sanctuary. So the verses that I brought out before that we are a kingdom of priests, let's read them. Exodus 19, verse 5 through 6. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. Can you, can you hear, out of, out, of that, out of those first words, can you hear the Father talking to Adam and Eve? Especially to Adam, right? If you obey my voice. Because he wasn't instructionless. He had plenty of instruction. You could hear. I could see the Father... I could see his signature superimposed right over these fir, fir, uh, first words to Adam. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So, if... That little but big word, if we obey his words, his voice, and obey his covenants, he shall make us his own possession among all the people of the earth. So, like us today, everybody outside these walls, if they believe in Yeshua, they can come into the inner to the outer courts. They can come in but only those who obey his voice and keep his covenants can come inside. So what happens in the new Jerusalem? Because that covenant that Yeshua came to renew that I talked about earlier, salvation is not the primary issue. People think that, you know, salvation is, but it's, it's the second issue. It's reinstating a covenant. Yeshua came to, to, re, to reestablish what the Father did to Israel when he divorced them. Because if he, if he never if he if he never patched the relationship, if you will, they would be just wandering fools until their physical life would come to it. They would live out their years and just return to dust. And that's it. Thank you for living out your 50 years, your 60 years, or 110 with some, you know, some surprises and extra precautions you take in this dying world. Great. And then you're dead. And so Yeshua had to die to reinstate that covenant so the bride could once again be in a covenant. So salvation is not the primary issue. It's to, be, it's to belong something. It's like... That's why I call it delusional. Most people think that they're going to marry somebody, but the groom is not even interested in you. It's like, do you understand that? He doesn't even know your name. What makes you think you're going to marry him? 
happens. I mean, I'm going to talk about my wife. It's like if, if she went around telling, oh, I'm going to marry this crazy Belarusian dude who I'm in love with, and I didn't even know her. Well, have you ever met the guy? No. Well, how do you know he's going to marry you? Well, because I just believe on his name. Okay. Well, okay. Good for you. <laughs> Where the bride knows the groom, knows what he wants, knows his likings, knows what ticks him off, knows what he will say if he doesn't see his bride doing something. And they have to be pretty serious things that, that the groom might get really irritated about. He's not going to be laughing. You burn my toast. You're done. We're never getting married. That's it. It's pretty serious stuff. When Yeshua says, depart from me, I never knew you. It's the ones who never really cared about that beautiful, intimate relationship. They never cared to, I want to come into the, the bedchambers. I'm just going to stay out here. Somebody else will fill that. Well, that's where the bride's going to be, the inner court, the inner chambers. That's what our bedroom represents between a husband and wife. That's, that's the inner court because that's the intimacy with God. Revelation 5.10, You have made them to be a kingdom and a priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And so my conclusion is... The Book of Lamentations, and I love the book. It's a pretty scary book. If, if you're not doing his will, it's scary. You will weep if you're not doing his will. Let us search and examine our own ways. Every one of us. Let us search and examine our own ways. And turn again. Turn again to the Lord. Turn again for what? For counseling? To seek his will. That's what you do. When you turn again and you seek his will, presumption disappears. There is no more, should I really start this? Should I really do that? There's no more uncertainty. You know exactly what the Father wants, but people don't want that. And that's why, unfortunately, I, I get sarcastic. I get very passionate about destroying the body. And that's why I'm so adamant, adamant about in our fellowship is that we are siblings. And that's such a beautiful thing because we're a family. And at the same time, we're a bride coming together in agreement. Sure, sure, we're not going to be bosom buddies because we're not going to like click on certain issues. But as long as we carry out the commission and do... What he tells us, obey my voice and keep my covenants, that right side of the brain, we'll start working again. The side that gives you illustrations, that sign that gives you long-term memory, not short-term memory, long-term memory. The side that thinks outside of the square, that thinks outside of denominational creeds, the side that has no sense of time, because we live in a sense of time, that's your left brain talking. Oh, got to do this now, blah, 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 blah. Father does not live in time. He created time. He gave us the moon and the stars as, as his reckoning of time for us so we can meet on his appointments. But it's not, it's not for him. He doesn't have to keep a calendar. He is the calendar. And I love this part. The right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. So if you're not using your right brain, you're numb. You're partially numb. You can't receive the anointing. This is why it's so, it's so crucial for every preacher who teaches that they teach people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. Father, I just want to pray. I thank you, Father, for making us a kingdom of priests. After the order 
of eternal, everlasting, perpetual priesthood, not Levitical, not set up by man to accomplish things of man, but set up by you, Father. The order of Melchizedek, Yeshua, our high priest. I thank you, Father, for making us your people, for grafting us into your family, us as Israel, Father, the northern tribes, climbing under the stones, out from under the stones, coming out of the woodwork, Father, seeking your knowledge. I thank you, Father, for the teachers that are out there. I thank you, Father, for the anointing that, that touches all people who, who, who take the instruction as written in Ecclesiastes to weigh in and compile the Proverbs, the Scriptures, in the rightful context to teach people knowledge and do it with great care, Father. So your truth is not subtracted from or added to. I praise you for those teachers. I thank you, Father, for the anointing over those teachers. I thank you, Father, for the, that they will continue to do that, that you will humble them, that you will remind them the vomit that they came out of. Because that's what this world is. This world is sin, sick, sin, saturated. It's, it's disgusting to you. You told us through Yeshua that we're, although we're in the world, we're not of the world, Father. And so I praise you and I use these strong words that we're climbing out of the, the, the disgusting things that we used to live in. That we're completely separated from you, Father. Separated from your anointing. Separating, not having the right side of our brain that gives the elements that we're, we missed. Not communing with you. Not adhering, not listening to your voice, being taught man-driven doctrines. I thank you, Father, for your, for your blessing over us. I pray that you will keep us humble, that you remind each and every one here, Father, that we are siblings dear unto you, Father, that Yeshua wears that breastplate with the twelve tribes on his chest, close to his heart, ministering his people as a high priest should, to be a servant leader as he was, and still is, and will be. We praise you, Father. We praise you that he will not let us down, that we have a high priest as a mediator, that we can come in into the inner courts, and whether heirs of salvation to do that task. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for my brothers and sisters everywhere around this country, around the world. May they be blessed and refreshed by this wonderful Shabbat. Bless our week, Father, to come. Guard us, Father. Guard our hearts and our minds. Please, Father, work on the right side of the brain as you do on the left side of the brain. Restore that bridge between the two the two sides that receives that anointing, that, that nourishing sap that comes directly from you, Father. We, don't, we have no need of Urim and Thummim. You speak to us directly, Father, that we are a tabernacle. And we have our testimony written in our hearts, Abba. On our hearts, your Torah is written. We just praise you for that, Father. We thank you that we get to live out your words out loud, not minimizing, not doing anything in, in reservation, but showing the world exactly how it is. Sometimes with great boldness and in love. Gentle like a dove and wise as a serpent, Father. Discerning and using your formula for success, as Yeshua taught us. Father, I pray blessings upon everybody, Father. Let your name be known, Father. Let us, let, let us not hide your glorious name. Not the titles, but your name, Father. 
We praise you, Yahweh. We thank you, Father, for your promises. as we draw near to you and as we close out the Shabbat, Father, which is just in a few hours. I pray that any wisdom that you give us, Father, will not be for our gain, but for your glory, that we will never replace anything that you've given, but use it for your good. You may give more because we want more, Father. Your children desire much. It says, those who seek, I will give. And to whom much is given, much will be required, Father. So we are accountable with what we are given because your truth is precious. And we do not take it lightly, but we, we take great care and, and hold great value of these things. our hearts cry out to you, Father, and we just thank you in this time of prayer. We thank you, Father. We thank you that you're drawing us near. We thank you for you, that you're giving us a teachable heart. We thank you for that nail-studded club that you have to use sometimes on your children because whom you love, you chase them. Help us to welcome that prodding Help us to, to accept that prodding, Father. Let not flesh get in the way, but let it, let it be hit with that, with that club because you are the shepherd and only you can use it. We as siblings just guard one another. We admonish one another. We edify one another. We just praise you for that, Father. We praise you in the great name of our high priest and counselor and master, the rabbi. Yeshua. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Good teaching. He was. <clears throat>